She is a member of OLLI for about seven years. Please welcome Ms. Peggy Barton. Ms. Peggy, you're on mute. If you go ahead and unmute yourself, Ms. Peggy, my apologies. Okay, there sorry we go. about that. Now we can get started. Okay. I want to get you in the mood for the beach, so we're going to start with this. Lost the sound. Go ahead and click on the video. Okay. I want you to get in the mood of being at the beach. Good morning and welcome to the Ali series honoring Black history and the second presentation on the tale of two beaches called Inkwell. Living the California dream in surf and sand was practically segregated in Southern California during the Jim Crow era. We're going to discuss Bay Street Beach located in Santa Monica and given the negative name of Inkwell and Bruce Beach adjacent to Manhattan Beach. The Bay Street Beach site was originally situated near Pico Boulevard where Shutter's Hotel and the Castle Del Mar are today. It emerged as a popular gathering place for African Americans from the Santa Monica and the LA communities in the, into the mid 1950s. From the early 1900s until the 1950s, it was a place where African Americans in Santa Monica could safely enjoy sun, sand, and surf without fear of harassment. It was a summer weekend gathering place. You would see everyone. All your friends were there, said Arthur Ivan J. Houston, a third generation Angelino, whose father encountered a race-based opposition of trying to build a black beach resort in the 1920s. The Phillips Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church was the city's first African-American church in Santa Monica. The church was named after Bishop Charles H. Phillip and Reverend J.W. Reese served as pastor. In 1908, the local congregation purchased, purchased a school building to be used as the church. The dedication ceremony was held on Sunday, July, October 31st, 1909, and was attended by more than 100 people. Now we're going to listen to a presentation by Dr. Allison Rose as she gives the background of how Phillips Chapel was started. Dr. Jefferson, what led the formation of the Phillips Chapel CME Church in Santa Monica, California? Well, Phillips Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church was founded in the first decade of the 20th century in Santa Monica. And aside from being the first African-American church in Santa Monica, it was the first church of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, the CME Church denomination in California on the West Coast. The, the African-American community here decided they wanted their own institution where they could worship, have political meetings, and socialize. And so this building that um, we see today was, uh, is the remodel building uh, of the original church, which was an old schoolhouse, a wood-sided schoolhouse that was moved to this location uh, in 1908. And then it was rehabbed uh, at that time for the first use of it. And then it was rehabbed and expanded again in the 1940s. And in 1949, it was dedicated. And this is the building that we have now. That was the 1949 building. Just as uh, African Americans were migrating to um, other places outside of the South where uh, 
uh, the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church was founded. They were moving to Baltimore, they were moving to New York, they were moving to uh, Detroit, to Chicago. The church was following the parishioners to the new locations that they were moving. And so one of the locations was Los Angeles, was Santa Monica, uh, in terms of the Southern California region. It was founded at a time when there was a community of African Americans that was forming in the city. And it was forming right around the station where the church is here at 4th and Bay Street. So here she gave a lot of the history behind the church. And as you notice, a lot of times our communities, our Black communities, are started near churches. There were Black-owned restaurants, bars, rental cottages, and stores near the Inkwell Beach in Santa Monica. That neighborhood was very important because it gave African Americans the ability to utilize the beach. They could be assured that with their church, bath house, restaurants, and the people they knew, they could have fun in the surf and sun at the Inkwell. Then things begin to gradually happen. The LA, the LA Times reported in 1922 this headline, Settlement of Negroes is Opposed. Santa Monica and Ocean Park blocks plan for colony of colored folks. The white homeowners and businessmen had formed the Santa Monica Bay Protective League. In 1922, the Santa Monica Bay Protective League attempted to purge African Americans from the city's shoreline. They did this by blocking the efforts of this investment group, Ocean Frontage Syndicate, led by Norman Houston, we know as affiliated with Golden State Mutual, and Charles Darden. These two black men wanted to develop a first class resort, an amusement facility with beach access at the end of Pico Boulevard. After these black investors were forced to abandon the plan, the property reverted to white ownership. Soon segregated hotels, exclusive clubs with fenced in beaches began going up in the area. In the late 1940s, city manager Randall Dorton aimed to redevelop large chunks of the beach town especially those areas with majority minority population. In 1957, the city adopted its first master plan. Not only was the Belmar area mostly flattened by eminent domain to make way for the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium and other public areas, the Penn Freeway was also planned for majority minority res res residential neighborhoods in the Pico area. The picture you see at the right of city officials watching over the burning of a house in the Belmar Triangle area in Santa Monica. They would actually bring out photographers as they burned down these previous own black homes and businesses. I can't understand that, but that's what they did. It's obvious that racism and classism led leaders to choose these areas. The construction of the freeway, which was completed in 1964, took out around 500 small homes and businesses. Some families were forced to move more than once as the city gobbled up more land through eminent domain. In this video, we're gonna hear one of the former homeowners in Long Beach and Ju um, Michelle Duncan and Jubilant Sykes tells their stories about family living, living legacy living in the Pico neighborhood in Santa Monica. All right, Michelle. Uh -huh. They're in front of my house, they're at my house. 
uh, to, to get the story of the neighborhood. So you, oh, can, so okay. you can stop by. All right. Okay. Hurry right. up. Bye. <laughs> That's the way it, it's. I'm the. I'm in the neighborhood. You know, I am. I'm Michelle and. That's Jubilon, and then there's Robbie. Robbie runs the Black Santa Monica Tours. She'll tell you about that. All right, Michelle, so I hear you have some stories to tell me. I do. It depends on what you want to hear about. Oh, Michelle, she's amazing. She's one of my favorite clients. I knew that that particular area in Santa Monica always looked different. It always felt different. There's a lot of small cottages next to these gorgeous mansions. And then across the way, you have um, an apartment complex. But then you have all these condos. A lot of development that's going on that isn't necessarily congruent. You know, Santa Monica, when I would go visit my relatives in Texas, or I met other blacks that lived in LA, and I would say, they say, where are you from? I'd say Santa Monica. And they go, oh, you live in that white man's town. <laughs> I go, there are all blacks around here. What do you mean, what? So when I would go out with my white friends that were also from Santa Monica, I saw that, why are there no blacks over north of Montana? Why are there no blacks over on the south side of Ocean Park? And this was considered, it was called the Pico area. My dad said, oh man, when, when I bought this property, we were only allowed to buy during, down this strip from Pico all the way to the beach. If you saw a house, in another neighborhood, you couldn't purchase it because of your color. Those are the covenants that they've had against quote unquote Negroes buying, renting, or owning property outside of this certain corridor. So a racially restrictive covenant that um, would have been put on a property deed uh, generally would say, Nobody that was African-American, Jewish, Mexican, Asian could buy the property or live in the property. So it was for Castilians only. A property that went for, I don't know, 50,000 back in the day or less, less. I think my father said he built this house for $14,000 or something. You know, that's really crazy, right? You know, it took, uh, I understand your question, and that is a good question. There's a lot of family history here. And so, therefore, it's kind of bittersweet, me leaving. I had to, I had some guilt, and I had some, I had to work through all that and decide what Michelle wanted to do. Um, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, there is a legacy here. As the citizens in this community move, so does somewhat of the history in their story. Everybody would meet at the beach. We didn't have to say, well, where are you going to be? Where are you? because we knew the only place we could be was at the foot of Pico, um, at the Inkwell. This was the area that the local people who lived here in Santa Monica wound up coming because there was uh, a public beach area and they were less likely to be harassed uh, by white people here than at some other, other beaches in Southern California. Inkwell meaning you know, you have a bottle of ink and it's generally black, right? And so it's an inkwell. It's where these black people go to sunbathe and, and swim and even surf. Illusion, as I did for many years, even I would argue with my dad, Times have changed, they are not the same. My dad would say, you've gotta be very shrewd and careful, you know, the white man, he's not always gonna be honest with you. And I go, dad, that's old, that's not the same. I never knew the story that this area was only for us to stay. We were not allowed, really, the unspoken rule to, to live this, to, to buy outside of this area. The old saying that 
a lot of people who buy a home in a neighborhood 20 years later could not afford to buy back into that neighborhood. And I find that through my experience and, you know, just meeting homeowners in that neighborhood and others, that that is absolutely true. Common misconception that the people who live in Santa Monica are all rich. That's what people think. Oh, if you live in West LA or Beverly Hills or any of those areas, you must be rich. That's not necessarily true because the majority of a lot of people's money where their real wealth is, is trapped in their home. So, you know, they're selling, you know, these multi-million dollar homes that, that these folks paid $50,000 for back in the day. So um, it's an opportunity for them to, to live comfortably. Not that they haven't always. The bittersweet is they're leaving. That's the bitterness of that. And, you know, I love being able to say that there are blacks in Santa Monica that helped establish this beach community. That's the, that's the, the beauty of this neighborhood is that we are somehow all connected. As these properties are being sold, the story behind this neighborhood, I fear it may be lost because the neighborhoods tell you the story through the inhabitants. Nothing ever, nothing ever ends. It just continues. It may stop here, but spirits are here. They're good spirits. I think the man that bought the house, I think he felt those spirits. I will be going to be near my granddaughter, and that's who I want a, a legacy with in another part of California. Notice how much she sold her house for. Santa Monica's newest open space, historic Delmark Park, will open virtually February 28th, this is next week, to unveil the culmination of Delmar's history and art project, a community-driven effort to explore, celebrate, and shine a bright light on the site of Santa Monica's former thriving African-American neighborhood that was destroyed during the Jim Crow era. Santa Monica was also the home of Nick Cabaldon, the first Black and Latino surfer documented in Southern California. In his teens, Nick taught himself how to surf at the Inkwell. In search of waves, he tried to hitchhike up to Malibu. No one would pick him up, so he paddled the 12 miles north on a huge, heavy wooden board to surf in Malibu. Nick served in the U.S. Navy Reserves during World War II. On June 5, 1951, Nick was killed in a surfing accident when he shot the pier and crashed. The city of Santa Monica still honors him for his pioneering strides in surfing each year. Next video we're gonna watch is the history of black surfers at the Inkwell. A group of educators are reconnecting black and brown youth to their heritage at the beach to the power of surfing. Good morning. Good morning. 
So seven years ago, we brought you know hundreds of kids to the beach, and they all ran up to the beach, and they stopped. And we're like, come on, jump in the ocean. And a lot of the kids raised their hand. And they're like, we can't swim. <laughs> so we started partnering with the YMCA's um, so that we could fund swimming lessons that would start in the winter. So they would take swimming lessons, and then that would end with Nick Gabaldon Day. I think in a perfect where the kids understand their connection to this ocean. I mean, oceans and water is very spiritual for a lot of people, and it's a place of, of calm and of um, welcome. And if people can feel welcome when they come to the beach, um, if they understand how they impact the health of this coastal system, um, then that's, that's a great lesson learned. Okay, so this beach was the place where African Americans would hang out during the Jim Crow era. Do you guys remember, did you learn in school what the Crow era means? You did what you learned. Okay, what's your name, sweetie? Una says that, and she's right, that the Jim Crow era was when black people were not treated the same way as white people. So do we know what the time period was? Very good, very good. So in terms of the Jim Crow era, all the years that you guys spoke of, that was encompassing of the time when we had lots of discrimination in the United States against black people. And it really started around 1900 and went to 1965, depending on where you were in the country. 1920s was just one of the early 20th century waves of African American migration. And it was one of the larger waves. But even by the turn of the 20th century, uh, Los Angeles area had the largest number of African Americans in the West. Uh, what brought people to Los Angeles and to California in general was uh, the California dream, just like everybody else had a California dream of new opportunities uh, in terms of their life. Uh, that could be employment, it could be in a way from Jim Crow discrimination. It was warm here. They heard about the, and saw pictures of the beautiful scenery, and that's what attracted them to here, all these life opportunities. So right here, they were, the county of Los Angeles was getting ready to do a beach nourishment program. And so they mapped out the beach, and they happened to identify that this was where the colored people used the beach. So just think about this. We're going to walk over to the monument, but think about this, you know, what you look at here, and then we're going to walk over to the monument, and then I'm going to tell you something more about that. What I see is this. I see kids that have never been to the beach, number one, so that's experience in of itself. Then they get out there, and then they see people in the ocean surfing or playing with with uh, with uh, with nature or just in the sand or on a boogie board that look just like them and they're like man <laughs> mr griffin you know uh, yeah you're going out there you know y'all know how to swim no yeah. no yeah. i don't know how to swim I I so for sure. you can swim I can. I can. I can. I can. Uh, who, who's I going to so sure. uh, you're the expert swimmer no. So they're meeting other kids. They're meeting their future classmates in high school, in college, doing a business deal together, a uh, sports rival, whatever. You know what I'm saying? But they're just getting exposure. They're getting outside. <laughs> you know, too many kids are doing this. There are some countries you want to visit. I want to visit
Surf Bus Foundation's North Star is to address the legacy of segregation in the county of Los Angeles. You know, the ocean is for everybody. It touches every continent. And here in LA, the water here needs to reflect Los Angeles. And at the moment, it doesn't. There's a thing that surfers live by called the Surfer's Code. And it was written out by a legendary surfer from South Africa, Sean Thompson. One, there's 12 tenets, and one of them is, I catch a wave every day, even if it's only in my mind. I take that to mean that, you know, we can't stop waves, but we can learn how to surf. When we bring our, our youth out to the ocean, it is amazing to watch the kind of athletes that kids are. It is amazing to watch kids from different neighborhoods and how they approach the ocean. And it's like, it's as much for me as it is for them. I learn every single time I watch a kid play. And it just, it, it opens up the whole world. Like we don't know what we're missing because we don't have the diversity in the lineup that the ocean is for. I got started with surfing through my skateboard. Uh, I was a skateboarder back in the 70s and uh, had friends that were that I met through skateboarding that were surfers. And uh, my boys and I, we all grew up in South Central and we went to the beach, got boards and started surfing. I've met people from all over the world in the water. When I'm surfing, I might be with somebody from Japan, somebody from Mexico, somebody from Eastern Europe, somebody from Hawaii, somebody from uh, Germany. And you may not even be able to speak their language but you can communicate with them and have fun with them in the water one thing that i know is it's here for everybody and there's a lot of people that grow in town that that they don't know they don't know about the beach they don't know about some of the areas that are available to us you grow up in la you think that your neighborhood is what's what's there for you but there's there's many things that you can do and so for me just bringing the youth out to the beach uh, from East LA, from South Central, from the Valley, bringing them out here for Nick Abaldon Day, which we have going on right now. It's important. It's, it opens their eyes to what's available to them. I actually moved to Santa Monica in 88. I actually grew up in LA in the Silver Lake Park area. Um, but my family is from Santa Monica. The roots started here. My great grandfather started the church on 4th and Bay Street. My grandma went to Samuel High and graduated in 1924. I played every sport and I played at a pretty high level, but nothing compares to surfing. And no matter how good of a surfer you think you are, the ocean's always in charge. Surfing is one of the greatest sports because it's like walking on water, but you're actually flying down the wave. You're on that wave and you're flying down the wave. It's more than walking on water, you're flying on water. A celebration of pain. Okay. Now, what are your other mates? <laughs> okay, so then you read the next section loudly. In the 1940s, Nayib, Nick Galvan, a son of a high school student, and the first documented last of the time of how to serve here. All right. Did you guys hear? Yes. Okay. So Nick Yabaldon grew up in Santa Monica. He was born in California. He was African American and Mexican American. Now there were other people surfing that were of color, but he's the one that we got paper on. And he's the one that we have stories about uh, because he surfed with the white kids up at Malibu. He's one of the reasons why uh, we do this day, Nick Gabaldon Day here, to commemorate all of the African Americans and Mexican American people and anybody else who have been marginalized by uh, the uh, American culture before to demand their access 
and rights to use the public beach here in Santa Monica and at other places. You guys are going to go and get your um, wetsuits on. Everybody got around right here. I had to share that video because of seeing these children being educated in a different way. And that's how we make our kids improve. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking I'm skipping one. I'm sorry. Let me go back. <laughs> All right. The second video is called Whitewash. In the complexity of race in America when I was through young, the eyes of what I really wanted to be, I believe, was just a surfer. And it was just enough for the white boys to be just surfers. The, the problem was I could never just be a surfer because I was always black. You know, I just assumed the stereotype. Blonde hair, blue eyes, tan, you know, just a dude. <laughs> I said, I think I'm going to be a surfer, man. And the kid looked at me dead in the eye, confused. He was like, surfer, you guys don't even swim. Uh, I've got a volume of an English sea captain who describes surfing in Ghana. Surfing at Cape Coast Castle. Why did they stop surfing along the coast of West Africa? History is written not by natives, it's written by the white European world at the time. ASP World Tour is like probably very close to 100 white. You see one black guy surfing for every hundred black guys surfing, you know, or more. I was made fun of uh, at school, walking down the street with my surfboard, dudes yelling, black people don't surf, starting to act white. This is a, a overwhelmingly white male sport that um, has been chronicled from Frankie Avalon and these beach uh, movies that came out particularly in the 1960s. You know, the myth that, that it's a white boy sport. That's absolutely absurd. It comes from a deeper place, way deeper, and it's it's gonna it's, it means a lot more. People want to ride these things. They want to have fun. And no matter where they are, they want to live and catch a wave too. You know I mean, they'll do do whatever is necessary within their means at that time to be able to ride a wave. Marcus Chapman is a Los Angeles County lifeguard who is an avid surfer and traveler. He has journeyed to many locations around the world looking for that perfect wave. The center picture is my nephew, Eric Garden, who also loves to catch a wave. And I just got this picture the other day. Thank you, nephew. So uh, I have a surfer in my family. Would I try it? No. Uh, a highlight to black surfers is their annual tribute to surfing pioneer, Nick Balaga. They also host surf outings every second Sunday of the month at the Inkwell Beach in Santa Monica. As the sun rose behind Santa Monica's typically foggy Santa Monica horizon, dozens of Angelinos across race, ethnicity, generations gathered, dressed in all white, carrying vibrantly colored flowers. They silently filed down to the Inkwell Beach to honor Black lives lost to state violence. It was only a week after George Floyd's murder and the uprisings were all in full swing, captivating, captivating hearts and minds around the globe. Curious locals asked what was going on. Some smiled and wished for peace. April Banks, Arian Edmund, and Ali Simon, three Black Angelinos, organized this sunrise meditation specifically at the Inkwell because so few people knew about its significance. As you see, the Inkwell was also used for healing. The monument's description reads, a place of celebration and pain. The beach near the site between Bay and Bicknell Street was an important gathering place for African-Americans 
long after racial restriction on public beaches were abandoned in 1927. It also states in the 1940s, Nick Avalon, a Santa Monica High School student and the first black and Latino surfer taught himself how to surf here. We're going to sail south or you can paddle down to Manhattan Beach. In 1912, Manhattan Beach was incorporated. The city's founder, George Peck, went against local norms of racial exclusion and set aside two beachfront blocks that African-Americans could purchase. Peck's Pier off 34th Street was the only pier in Southern California coast open to Black people. In 1912, Charles and Willa Bruce purchased for $1,225 the first two lots between 26th and 27th Street. In 1920, they bought another lot with a two-story building that they refurbished for dining and dancing purchase purposes. And their resort was complete, providing black families a way to enjoy a weekend on the coast. A few more Black families bought and built their own cottages by the sea at Bruce Beach. A community was born. The right of this picture is the, Bruce, the Bruce's wedding. They were uh, married in New Mexico and this picture was at their wedding in 1880. The Bruce's were harassed from day one after white people realized that they had bought the land. Mysterious fires, picketing swimmers, and roping off the beach intensified throughout the 1920s. The Ku Klux Klan was rumored to be behind some of the harassment. A photo in the center is showing a man standing under a sign that says, Negroes prohibited. When these various underhanded attempts to remove the black residents fail, the city condemned the neighborhood in 1924 and seized the land through eminent domain. The reason they said was an urgent need for a public park. That park was not built until 30 years later. The Bruce's and three other black families sued, citing racial prejudice. They sought $120,000 in compensation, $70,000 for their two lots and $50,000 in damage. After years of litigation, the Bruce's received $14,000, $14,500. The city made it impossible for them to move their seaside business anywhere else in Manhattan Beach. The whole resort was torn down in 1927. The land remained undeveloped for the next three decades. In the 1950s, fearing that the Bruce's heirs might sue to get their land back, the city planners decided to go ahead and build a park. In 2006, the city council voted three to two to rename the beach after the Bruce family. I need to state here that park had four additional names before they named it Bruce Beach. Here is the dedication ceremony that was done in the park in 2007. In the early 1900s, Charles and Willa Bruce built a beach resort within the two block neighborhood where this park in Manhattan Beach resides today. Bruce's Beach was one of the few beaches in Southern California where African American families could legally attend. As Bruce's Beach became more popular, racial hostility towards the African-American community grew. And in 1924, eminent domain was used to seize Bruce's Beach. When I told folks that my family once owned the beach here, they would laugh at me. They didn't believe African-Americans owned beaches. We as a community, as a people, have uh, reconciled something that has occurred in our past and working towards that, that healing. 
Some residents hope that one day the park will exhibit the history of Bruce's Beach through public art. You know, God loves everyone. Recognition that is long overdue. I'm Jerry Reeder with Time Warner SoCal News. One hundred and fifty descendants of Charles and Willa Bruce gathered at Bruce Beach Park for a family reunion in 2018. And this is a picture of some of those family members. They're still looking to negotiate the Manhattan Beach about making a historical memorial there at the park, much like what they're doing in Santa Monica. For the ending of my story, I'm going to use the work and poetry or spoken word of the artist Lucasa Rothman Barismo. The title of her work is called Inkwell. What does change mean for our city? A city marked by its relationship to the sea. The sunsets, the dazzling water, bronze bodies, costly restaurants, beachfront properties. A city lived by people, working class families, artists, change makers, coated in the ocean air, the vision in our mixed up town. But we watch the eraser of a community of people before our eyes. Inkwell Beach at the end of Pico, where the African-American communities of LA relaxed on their days off in the 1920s and 30s. One of the few Southern California beaches where Blacks were legally allowed. How do we tell this history? Take a specimen of our city, treasure it, care for it, and pass on this history. And here are some of my resources that I used. A lot of information from Allison Rose Jefferson. We saw a couple of the videos that she was in, an amazing historian. And I also want a special thank going out to Esther Bohanna, who is a member of Bali, who sent me the information about Bruce Beach that was in a LA Times article that added me, had me add to this presentation. So that's the end of my tale. The story of two beaches called Inkwell. Reflect back now on the history of people who only wanted to have fun in the surf and the sun. I was trying to do a virtual ending, so if you didn't hear it, what I was saying, so that's the end of my tale, the story of two beaches called Inkwell, reflect back now on the history of a people who only wanted to have fun in the surf and the sun. So that's the end of my presentation. We can now open it up. Emma, for discussion or questions or statements, anything that anyone would like to say. Absolutely, Miss Peggy. I think she deserves a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Let me go ahead and boop, boop. switch this again. It was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Very informative. Yeah. I had no idea. I knew about Bruce's Beach, but I didn't know about Santa Monica. I, I, I didn't know about any of it. Oh. <laughs> I just went to Santa Monica Beach. I mean, I would go there without knowing that there was any kind of uh, ill will against anybody in the past or, you know, yeah. maybe when I was growing up, I didn't know. I don't remember specifically being a child at Santa Monica Beach. Probably we, my parents knew better, but I, I definitely <laughs> don't even know. I didn't even know about this. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you know, you. I stumbled upon the Inkwell Beach Santa Monica when I was doing the other research on Martha's Vineyard. And I was, you know, I Googled. And I was Googling, and I said Inkwell, and Santa Monica came up. And I said, what? And that's how I started <laughs> going back and researching and finding out about uh, Santa Monica. Well, thank you. 
very much. Thank yeah, we appreciate you. it. Oh, yes, yeah, outstanding presentation. It was just great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank How you, Peggy? <laughs> Thank you, Peggy. I remember back in the early um, 2000s when my kids were young and they had a competition with Black Surfers in the Malibu. And I took them and that was the first time that I've heard of, um, you know, the Black uh, Surfers. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, it, and it was really fun because they had a lot of activities for the kids, you know, besides them, you know, doing their surfing competition. So it was fun. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Peggy, for that. This is Caroline. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I'm a Thank member you. of our study club, and we've been on those beaches a number of times through our, through our um, program that we have going to, you know, L.A., the different mm -hmm. areas. That was beautiful, and it was very well presented. Thank you. Thank you. Peggy, this is uh, Judy, Judy Calvin. I'm going to give you another chore to do for all of us. Find out the <laughs> heritage and the story of Cabrillo Beach. Yeah. This is a wow. beach that my family went to as I was a child. Right. Also, right. my son, who's 56 years old, did surf back in the day when he was 15 at Cabrillo mm -hmm. Beach. Do that mm. for us, Peggy. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. <laughs> well, the first scene you guys saw with me, I was trying to make it virtual with the water, and you saw the awesome. background of Catalina, you heard the water. That was, Judy, you call the word, because I can't say it. Cabrillo. 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 Yeah, we all went. Cabrillo. 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 I remember <laughs> when we went there, we went there Sunday, Valentine's Day, Nisi and Cray and I decided to escape, and that's where we went. And I was sharing with Cray that we used to body surf. Did any of you all body surf? No. So you swam mm -hmm. out and yeah. you caught the weight. But you you just ro you rolled in with your your body, and it was fun until the day that I didn't think I was gonna come out of it. So that was the end of that. <laughs> and they also have a wonderful museum there. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. And it's a really great yeah. place to go. Yeah, yeah. But the other thing, again, I want to make sure and invite you guys to go to the virtual celebration. Uh, the Santa Monica Belmark area. I think she's put it down in the chat line. You can see it there. And it's on the 28th, so you can register. It's another Zoom event. But I have to give Santa Monica credit. They're trying in their own way to clean up their act, you know. Uh, and you can understand where Blacks probably leave those families that are still there because it's a situation of gentrification now. You saw where the woman sold her house for one million seven hundred thousand dollars. Wow, yeah. one point seven million. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know what happens with that when the tax, if the houses are going for a million plus, and you bought your house for fifty thousand, that means your property tax is going to go up. Yeah. So uh -huh. how do you keep that? And that's uh -huh. how gentrification can, can really destroy a black community. Because those who even, like you said, bittersweet, you know, trying to hang in there and stay on the property and then they can't anymore because of various situations, property tax to be one of the major ones. So anyway. What year was that? What year was that that she sold? Oh, that's recent. Cause you remember she had the mask on. Yeah. Okay. And they said they're selling more now during the Yeah, pandemic. they are. They are. So that says something too, where there's still another kind of maybe taking advantage of, you know, kind of thing. But um, yeah, for me being a native Californian and finding all this out about our beaches here, because again, I can remember my mother talking about going to Santa Monica. But she went to a CME church and it was called Phillips Temple. And you know oh, how yeah. all the churches were kind of connected? Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think they did like water baptisms and stuff there. So I think that's why she went, you know, we that's where she went as a little girl. But again, she never took me there. My parents, we never went there. We went to the beach I can't pronounce. <laughs> the real beach. Yeah. So I wonder if that's why we didn't explore. Santa Monica when I was growing up. 
Texas, you know, that's in the 50s. And that's when they're burning down the, the homes that were there and getting rid of the businesses that were there. So I could understand why we would probably stay away from that area at that time. Mm -hmm. Peggy, Ms. Peggy um, we have uh, Godfrey raising his hand. And then from Godfrey, we're going to jump to Ms. Eunice Kramer. Okay. Hey, Peggy, I think Go ahead, the, Godfrey. Thanks for the history, Peggy. Um, didn't really know that. Uh, we, I, we had friends, my father and mother had friends that lived on Pico near 4th Street. And, um, and they owned an apartment building there and didn't, didn't know about all the covenants and how they got their, their property. Mm -hmm. but we used to walk down to the beach from there, down Pico, and probably right to the Inkwell. We didn't even know the history behind it. You, you, you give us a lot of history today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the difference between the Inkwell here and the Inkwell in Martha's Vineyard, they embraced the name. Here, they did not. It's called Bay City, and they, that's what they still call it. Because you remember the, the lady, which was telling you, said, well, it's like an Inkwell, and it's dark. But where in Martha's Vineyard, they turned it and flipped it around because it was like, well, the authors that come here from the Harlem Renaissance, they dip their pen in the ink, and they write well. You know, so they turned that negative name into a positive. Where here, I don't think they made particular reference to the beach being called Inkwell. I guess that's why we never knew growing up here. You know, that was the name. All right. Next question, Eunice. Okay. Thank you so much for this outstanding presentation. Oh, you're welcome. One of the things that crossed my mind, as you said, it was very recent that they sold that house. But this Prop 19 that passed last November uh, is really a good family if home. Now, if a woman had to pass, keep it, pass it on, rent it out, and pass it on to her children for them to use and rent to Black families who would appreciate it and keep the the neighborhood, they can't do it anymore. You can only pass on to your children if you're living in it and they're living in it and they've restricted a whole bunch of other things. Again, to kind of break up things, mm -hmm. somewhat to break up uh, the wealthier, but it certainly is breaking up communities. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you so much for the presentation. I lived and worked in Santa Monica, and not in Santa Monica, but in uh, Manhattan Beach, and I knew the way they named it for their sister city um, to kind of pretend like they were giving deference to what they had already done. And when I first moved out here, um, the beach that I was told about was a black beach, was Doc Dockweiler Beach. And... Um, you know, so people who don't even remember the earlier ones because they were wiped out um, would think of uh, Doc, but it wasn't a surfing beach. I mean, that it's in front of refineries, uh, but that's the way I remember when I first moved out here uh, as a beach, and that was far later. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I don't think that you really well into the history of leisure things that, you know, different ethnic groups do. We don't include that as a part of the history. We talk about the leaders or we'll talk about the laws, but there's such a, it's a much bigger picture. All this in, encompass around our lives, how we are affected by, and again, systematic racism, this leisure, going to a, a swim, in fact, I didn't get into some of the detail when the white business owners built these hotels and stuff, and they, you know they broke up. They put um, fences around the beach. And that was the inkwell to keep the blacks out. But the bands, the big bands, would be playing in these hotels. And you know we're very creative people. We would go out to the beach at night and dance. The, the big bands that were playing in the hotel. So, you know, hey, you do what you have to do. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Peggy. We also have a question in the chat coming from Ms. Patricia Eddy, and then from there we'll jump in with uh, Ms. Delina. 
-hmm. But the question in the chat is, I don't fully understand how eminent domain works, but it makes me wonder about all the gentrification going in Los Angeles. How often is eminent domain used for land grab? Whenever they want your land. <laughs> <laughs> if it, you know, they'll go back and rewrite. It's interesting, the law and how it's written and how it's used to dominate. Uh, to give you another example, when my grandparents lived off of 116th Street, the area was called Logic Track. And these were beautiful homes that uh, Mr. Blodgett wanted working class Black people to have an area where they could live and feel comfortable. He even had a bank where they could get money and pay for the loan for the house. And uh, some of the homes were even two-story homes. Well, anyway, when they were going to build the 105 freeway, 100 years almost before they were going to build the 105 freeway, same thing in Santa Monica. That freeway was a killer of neighborhoods, OK? And they took those homes down and they used eminent domain because this freeway was more valuable for the overall community, eminent domain, than your house or your family. So this is not only used here, it's used all over this country. This is just an example of how it's used. Thank you, Ms. Pay. Go ahead, Ms. Delina. And then from Delina, we're gonna go with Ms. James Seta Hammond. Well, I was just going to say and re, re um, iterate what was said in the video that the takeaway here is this history is just going to be swept under the carpet again. Uh, you had to do a whole lot of research to inform us, but look at all the people that have no idea, no clue about what happened, what, what happened on, on, on this particular beach, which to mm -hmm. me is like a microcosm of what's happening all over the, the country. The, the fact that people's land was taken away by eminent domain, domain, the fact that they were, they had all these restrictive covenants um, all over LA and the fact that they had black surfers. Now, I knew that they had black surfers because my own cousin who's now probably about what, 68 and is still surfing. I knew him to be one of the, well, the only black surfer I knew personally and I, I, I didn't get it. I was like, how could you be a black surfer? But then I do know that in his case and his brother's, his late brother's case, they were both surfers, avid surfers. They, they lived a life of, you know, they were pretty well off. Their parents, uh, well, they grew up in View Park, for example. Mm -hmm. And he, I don't think he has ever had a real nine to five job. He never did. So you have to have the time, you have to have resources. the, the resources, because it's not, it's, it's not cheap. You have to have a wetsuit because he does it in the winter time, the summertime. Uh, there's not a day, I don't think there's a day that goes by today, now, that he doesn't serve. Maybe he serves a little less, maybe five times a week instead of every day. So that's, that's, that's amazing that all this history just gets, yeah. it just disappears. I was so glad to see, and again, I just learned this, you all, in the last what, two weeks, <laughs> Googling, when I just really, encourage everybody anything you want to know google it but uh to find out um how you know i'm sorry i missed my point there a senior moment um uh, anyway next question <laughs> <laughs> next question is from uh james setta hammond go ahead and unmute yourself and then from there we'll uh jump over to patricia eddy it's not a question. I want to thank Peggy for uh, this presentation. Uh, Peggy and I go back to junior high school. <laughs> so um, what my takeaway is, um, I'm now motivated to do research on my Smith family. Um, I had a great uncle who left Texas and um, maybe 50, 60 years after he arrived here in California, the um, attorneys 
were able to get uh, in touch with my other great uncle and, and split money from his estate. And it was said that he had beachfront property. And so hearing about the young man, Remy Smith, um, and that's the surname that I'm searching. Um, he said that his, his, he grew up in Los Angeles, but he had relatives on the beach that lived in Santa Monica. So I've got work to do and find out which beach. Beachfront property yielded enough money to be split between my grandmother's four surviving children about 10 years ago. Thank you, well, Peggy. I know what happens. <laughs> I will, I will. Hope oh, eminent domain didn't show us a ugly face. <laughs> Okay, Patricia, I know you had a comment earlier. Yes, I, I just wanted to say that, first of all, I'm so grateful for the, this class. And some of you know that I belong to Ollie and I have my membership through OmniLore, which is a, another learning and retirement group that's affiliated with Ollie. And I have to say that for an, uh, an Omnilore, we're reading the book in my, one of my classes, the book Cast, that's written by Isabel Wilkerson. And I have to do a presentation on that. And so I chose to look into redlining and residential security or segregation. And what I discovered, I started looking at the United States, but I went down this rabbit hole of Los Angeles. And I was just like, everything I was reading, I was saying, oh my gosh, oh God, I didn't know. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And Santa Monica was part of that story. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think I'm hopeful. I, I'm very optimistic <laughs> about the fact that if people continue to buy these best-selling books and read and join things like uh, Ollie, that maybe we can all get more informed. And I felt actually relieved to hear that some of you that are of the Black community didn't know this history. So it's not just me that you know is oblivious to this history. So maybe we all need to learn. And the other comment I wanted to make, Peggy, in regard to leisure, you were talking about leisure. I have a, a good friend uh, who's a, a black woman and her memory oh. of her family going to uh, what they called the Black Palm Springs. It was a, a place up in the mountains here in Southern California, I can't think of the name of it, but she said, we called it the Black Palm Springs. And it was like, they couldn't go to other resort areas. So they built their own resort. I don't know if it still exists or not, but I was aware of that. That's all oh. I wanted to say. Thank you. Alverde was the name of Alverde. Uh, mm -hmm. He had to have an equivalent of everything that we were locked out of. So you don't let us in, we'll go make our own. That's what we did. So. <laughs> <laughs> we created we our own. From, right we on. have a comment from Cartelia, Brian, and then we'll jump uh, to Pearlie. Um, yes, I was going to mention uh, uh, Valverde, but uh, I forgot, uh, Peggy, you mentioned uh, the Blodgett tract. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a member of the California African American Genealogical Society. We have a member, uh, James Eddy, you know her, Peggy. She is a, um, she lived in the Blight. I know Peggy. Blight. Oh, you know, I know Peggy. Peggy. Yeah, okay. we were both docents at camp. And, <laughs> and in fact, yeah. I did yeah. research on Blodgett Track because my grandparents lived there. Mm -hmm. I found the original deed. Oh, wonderful. And they paid $5,000 for that house. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was sharing it with her. And when you, you know, when you gave me, you know, the book you guys write, uh, she included that information when they, uh, about her story and Blodgett Track. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, 
And the reason why they had the, Mr. Blodgett had the bank is because blacks couldn't get loans for homes at banks. And I don't know why people are always saying, especially in our, at our age, of saying that they're surprised. You live in America. <laughs> this is, Amer this is the story of America. Thank you. Um, and uh, James Zeta, what another one of our members are related to the Bruce's, Dorothy Lou is related to the Bruce family. Oh, That's wow. part of her. Uh, so you you hear these things. And we and there are still people that don't know that years ago, black people lived in Venice. One of our um, former members, uh, she passed away several years ago, Melrose Bell. She was born in Venice. Right. You know how they came to Venice? Yeah. You know how the Black people came to Venice? Yes. Build yes. those canals. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were restricted so. to a certain area. Yes. They couldn't live anywhere in Venice. In fact, they went to that Phillips Chapel because there was not a church. We've always been tied to our churches. Right. And so since there wasn't a church at the beginning in Venice, they would go to that Phillips Chapel because, you know, Venice is right next door to Santa Monica. Santa Monica. Yeah. And there was a, don't get me started. That was the other beach, but I'm going to leave. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Go on. Next question. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, ahead, I, I just wanted to remind people yes. that uh, uh, sometimes you have to learn your history. You have to learn your history uh, to know your America. Um, yeah. This is just the facts of life. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Pearlie. Thank you. Patricia was talking. I'm going to give you a call because uh, I have something I would like for you to do for CAGS. <laughs> Kind of me? No, James Edda. Oh, Jamie. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Private conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go ahead, Pearly. Thanks. Patricia was talking about a, 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 a rabbit's hole. And that kind of reminded me, you know, I didn't know anything about the beaches per se, but now you've opened up this big topic, you know, about property and where blacks were and weren't allowed and all that stuff in the big history. I appreciate that very, very good presentation. Um, I was thinking in terms of uh, the, the, the blacks that could not, were not allowed to own property, especially in the South. So, and, and it's, it's uh, now there's a place that I heard about some years ago uh, in New York, uh, the, the barrier grounds that they were, they were excavating for something back there some time ago and there was a documentary on it years ago. Uh, and now I'm really interested in looking at that and looking at other beaches and all the other things like that. But there was the, the barrier grounds in New York that they found. Um, I'm looking at all this property and I want you to know why. Why is it that there is usually the best property, the best real estate? And the reason in the South, I can understand that, you know, being from the South, that uh, my parents came about getting property in a, a different kind of way, uh, by inheriting it from uh, uh, some, some white ancestry. Uh, and that happened often in the South. We've had our property over a hundred years in the South, but, but you know, if we work in the lands anyway, and we're managed much better for something that's more profitable to just work the land. If you get your own piece of land, you, you don't have to be beholden to anybody else. You can raise your own crops, just like you're raising other people's. I, I can understand the logic for that, but uh, it has to be connected with money, the, the prime real estate, the beaches and things like that. And I just think that's just a travesty of, <laughs> of justice, but I'm very interested now. You've whetted my appetite. Thank you for this. America. Gee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really well, do you know that where Central Park is, black people live there. That was they call it what Seneca? Mm -hmm. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. They move the people out. They move the people out. Well yes, the park. It's, it's eminent domain. America people. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, and they didn't and didn't compensate them. They just threw them out. Oh, and, yes. Uh -huh. And underneath Central Park, you can see, uh, you can find the remains of, of black families. Yeah. It's wow. yeah, that's just it's just simple. It's America. What yeah. well, Louisiana too, think about Louisiana, a lot of people had the, the beachfront property where a lot of the minorities own that property, beachfront property. So now when they're building those, those high rises after the, the, uh, the what was that, the tsunami? Oh, Katrina, Katrina. Yeah, Katrina, yeah. And oh. they're building those uh, high rises now, the blacks that live there can't even afford to, they're, a lot of them sold their land and left. 
but that's prime property. Think about that. It's, uh, it was, you know, and still is. Oh, boy. Anyway, <laughs> that's it. Hey, Don, Don. Yeah, right. there's, a, there's a YouTube video on the building of Dodger Stadium. Uh, that area was a black and brown community. And uh, they took that area from the black and brown people, sold it to the owners of the Dodgers for one dollar. Mm. Another case of disrupting a black community for economic reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Go ahead, Elaine. I see you have your hand up. Why the Dodgers left New York because the owners said the neighborhood was getting too dark mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, yeah. Go ahead, Goffrey, but you're on mute. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Goffrey. You're really, really I'm hard. sorry. <laughs> anyway, I'll be interested, Patricia, and I'm not sure if you gave your presentation already. Um, if you could do it for Ali uh, on redlining in, in the LA area. Uh, yeah. We here, um, I moved here in 1952, 1951, 52, and we lived by Fremont High. And, um, and I was wondering at that time, you could see where people lived and there, there were borders and whatnot where you shouldn't go beyond and whatnot. So it'd be interesting to find out how things got started with all the redlining at that time. I'm not sure if you've already done that or not in your presentation. I'm the Lord. I could talk to uh, Nicole and you know, see if, if there's a, a need or a desire for that presentation. I think it's interesting, you know, it, it's good to know the background of how land was taken. Uh, I know it has to do a lot with the laws and how things were reworded in order to fit the situation. Like, um, this I found interesting, Goodyear, Goodyear moved to Southern California. I don't know if any of you are old enough. Uh, they had the red line, <laughs> three cars. And the reason why they got, you know, because we didn't have mass transportation like they do in other, you know, big cities. But we did have like the, the red street car. And they got rid of that because Goodyear wanted to make tires. So you, you got a product, you want tires. So you need to have what? cars. So you need to have a way that these cars go down. So you build freeways. So that was the end of our mass transportation here in LA. But we did have the little electric cars until Goodyear came in with their, I'm going to call it what it is, greedy cells and change the whole dynamics of the area. Um, go ahead, Godfrey. Nothing about Goodyear. It, it, they had a plant site not too far from where we live. I used to, I have to walk to Edison Junior High School, walk past this every day from, from where I lived by Fremont. Anyway, um, good year when we were growing up, they had, used to have community things done at the plant site. And one year uh, for Christmas, Santa Claus was supposed to be coming to Goodyear. And uh, so he, so they put Santa Claus in a helicopter and he came, he was coming to Goodyear and the helicopter crashed. All the kids thought Santa Claus had died. It was bad. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <Actually. laughs> All right, Miss Peggy. <laughs> Thank you, Godfrey. Uh, we do have a quiz as part of this lecture, uh, Miss Peggy. So I'm ready to launch it whenever you're ready. Okay. You know me. You got to okay. have a test at the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right.